for me and for the magic shows that I've that I've witnessed and been a part of that work, magic has to happen in the first 30 seconds. Now, I know we've been taught, like, they need to get to know you. They need to, you know, you need to have a diatribe for a monologue for the first five minutes so they know who you are. I used to believe that, but now I believe that they need to see that you're magic. And so for me, right away, 30 seconds in, they're seeing something right away. And as as we know, as magicians who've been, if you perform for a while, a vanish, bottle, a, a vanish without the reappearance bothers people. I will have people at the end of the show after seeing, you know, a very list of maybe 50 tricks will come back and say, but where did that champagne bottle go? It still bothers them, which I like. I don't mind that. A lot of magicians like, well, you need a denouement where you produce it at the end. I don't agree with that. I, I feel like this this gets their attention, holds their attention, and they're instantly off. We're instantly off to the races. Hello and welcome to another episode of Desert Island Tricks. We have our first Canadian-born guest, um, but as he's just discussed with me, he does now live in America. So I'm very, very excited for this. You're going to have seen the title of who this person is. It's another person who really we shouldn't have an introduction for. He is a prolific inventor of magic. He's been around this scene for a very long time. Some of the biggest tricks that you've probably heard of especially for stage and parlor um you know he is master of pack small plays big and i think what what bill's done with his creations over the years is he's made it so accessible to everyone i mean smart ass which i'm sure will be on his list it has to be in in some capacity you know i i wonder how many hundreds of performers around the world perform that week in week out um and if they haven't then they they will in the future it'll be something that'll be around for forever anyway enough of me babbling about how awesome he is because we're going to hear how awesome he is with his list ladies and gentlemen this is mr bill abbott hello bill hello i feel weird calling you bill abbott i feel like i should call you mr abbott or or something more formal <laughs> Sir Abbott, yes. Sir Abbott, there you go. We need to have, yeah, why don't we have like magic royalty where people are knighted? <laughs> that would be great. I don't be there yet, but I mean, I'm not, I'm not close enough to the, to the, to the royal, uh, you guys are closer to the royalty over there. And... <laughs> well, you never know. They sit, they tend to visit you guys quite a lot over in, in a Well, there's a lot more people. Yeah, they, they keep, they, they keep defecting over to here. <laughs> well, we're not a political podcast. We will not no. go there. Um, <laughs> how did you find making the list? Did you find it particularly... Because your career is so diverse. It must have been quite difficult getting everything down just to eight pieces of magic. Not at all. I actually just honestly just copy and paste, copied and pasted my, my set list that I normally do for uh, corporate shows. They're not in... They're not in the exact order I would do them in, but it's it was pretty much the stuff that I do all the time, and I feel like that was that was an easy. It was actually an easy decision. I guess there's a million tricks I could put could have put on, but these were the eight that I knew. Well, anyways, this is this is the, these are the ones I wanted in my desert island. Amazing, that's great. So if you are joining us for the first time on this podcast. The concept is we are going to whisk Bill away to his own desert island. When he's there, he's allowed to take eight tricks or one book and one non-magic item that he uses for magic. Particulars like where the island is, how big it is, who's there, are there animals, are there people, that sort of stuff. We do not mind. It's all about the ultimate list of tricks that Bill could not live without. That being said, we're going to jump on whatever form of transport you would like to get to your island, Bill, and we're going to find out what's in your first position. So the first thing I do for first of all, let's set the scene. If it's on a desert island, uh, I will have made um, a beautiful tiki bar with a stage, um, but a limited stage. It might seat maybe maybe fifty people at the most. So a very intimate environment, so everyone can be up close to the magic. So that's the vibe that I would like to 
to experience and to perform for these random natives that are living on this island. island. And my very first trick would be my champagne opener. Uh, this is not something I've released publicly or, you know, or on the magic market, but it is essentially a vanishing bottle opener. And the reason I, and I've been opening with it for only about a year and a half, maybe, uh, especially at my weekly gig at the magic hideaway in, in St. Augustine, Florida, I opened with this because it gets attention right away. Um, the premise is that I'm going to give away this bottle of champagne. So, uh, and I've used various ruses, whether it's, um, we're celebrating my birthday. Hey, we're celebrating, you know, it's, it's the weekend. We're going to celebrate whatever, but the, the excuse is that, and because of that, you know, in, in, uh, in partnership with the hotel, we are giving away this beautiful bottle of champagne, thanks to the bar. And this is the, this is the game. The game is this. I want, I'm going to think of a wild animal on the count of three. You're all going to yell out the wild animal you think I'm thinking of. Whoever gets whoever gets it right gets to take home the bubbly. And we have a to-go bag because it's Florida. So then I put the champagne bottle in the bag and I count to three. They all yell out the wild animal. They, you know, they think I'm thinking of. I pause a beat and then I crumple the bag and say, I'm sorry I didn't hear it. And I throw it away. And and then my tagline usually is like, you know, there's no pain like champagne. I probably just saved you all from a hangover, that type of thing. So that's, that's the, that's, and so right away, I guess what I've learned in the past, even in the past couple of years is like, for me and for the magic shows that I've, that I've witnessed and been a part of that work, magic has to happen in the first 30 seconds. Now, I know we've been taught, like, they need to get to know you. They need to, you know, you need to have a diatribe for a monologue for the first five minutes so they know who you are. I used to believe that, but now I believe that they need to see that you're magic. And so for me, right away, 30 seconds in, they're seeing something right away. And as as we know, as magicians who've been, if you perform for a while, a vanish, bottle, a, a vanish without a reappearance bothers people. I will have people at the end of the show after seeing, you know, a very list of maybe 50 tricks will come back and say, but where did that champagne bottle go? It still bothers them, which I like. I don't mind that. A lot of magicians are like, well, you need the denouement where you produce it at the end. I don't agree with that. I, I feel like this this gets their attention, holds their attention, and they're instantly off. we're instantly off to the races. The other thing I will add is when it disappears, or when I, I say – Someone's going to win, get get to win this bottle of champagne. I will get a shout. I'll get, woo, you know, somebody, you know, usually a lady or whatever will be like, yay, or something like that. And then my tagline, you know, my, I will have a various, you know, improv lines, but one will be, well, we found, we found the alcoholic in the group or something like that. <laughs> something, something along those lines, obviously without being too harsh, but, but the idea that the interaction is instant as well. And as we know, once you get an audience physically, and verbally involved with the show, the faster you can do that at the very beginning of the of the of your show, the more they will be apt to respond, whether it's verbally to a trick, physically helping you as a volunteer, participating. So right away, they're thinking of a wild animal. They're yelling out their wild animal, and they're they're mentally and physically involved, verbally involved, which for, for me, that's really important. Not only in the first 30 seconds, but in the first five minutes, I want everyone really, which leads into the next effect, obviously. But but that's the idea, is that within 30 seconds, they're seeing magic and they're, you know, mentally and physically and verbally involved. Yeah, it's a perfect, absolutely perfect opener. Um, and one thing that's just occurred to me is I think you're probably our first guest who has actually done a... Uh, a structured list from hmm. closer opener that sort of thing so even trying to picture what that would be like you can really gauge where your your thinking's going to go with this set list i think mm -hmm. i think so too so that brings us on to your second one so you've sort of teased it there by saying which brings <laughs> us on to the next one so what's in your second position so the second position uh 
Can I go back to the first one just for a second? Of course. I, I very quickly, I wanted to say that champagne opener. The other reason it works well is because it's a macro effect. Is This is what um, Bob Cassidy would call a macro effect. A micro effect is something that happens on one or two spectators. You know, everyone's watching it, but they're vicariously involved. Where the champagne opener, where they're thinking of a wild animal, it's a macro effect. Everyone's involved. Everyone's thinking of a thing or thinking of whatever the whatever the thing is. So I feel like that's the other reason it works really well is because you're getting everyone involved at the same time as opposed to picking on some guy in the front row or whatever. Excuse me. That's why it. I, I, that's the other reason I love it is because it gets everyone involved and it's a macro effect. So you could do this in a in a in a ballroom. I do it in a 25 seat theater every week in Florida. Uh, so that's, that's the beauty of it as well is that it can be done surrounded. You can do it. Um, you can basically do it naked. Uh, if that's the kind of shows you're doing, if, if it, depending on the, you know, it's depending on the environment. Um, and I have all kinds of subtle convincers. I will take, I will come out with the, with a, with a spoon and be, you know, clinking the, clinking the bottle to, you know, all these little convincers to make it play really well. But anyways, I, uh, I interrupted myself. Let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's true. That's great. Um, and that brings us on to your second position. So what's in the second place? Second place is my five card box routine. And it's, uh, it's a story. So um, the intro, I, I'll just give you the, the script is, I will say, if you've never seen me before, I, I know you're already thinking, you're thinking, hey, I wonder if this guy's any good. But more importantly, I wonder if you guys are any good. So I've got a bit of a test. You pass this test. This could be the greatest night of your lives. You don't pass this test. This could be the longest six hours you've ever endured. <laughs> so that right off the bat, that's my segue into the five card box. So then I say, I'm going to show you the very first trick I ever performed. I was 12 years old. I got a magic set for Christmas. I did my very first show in my parents' basement up in Toronto, Canada, where we have basements. And right beside the laundry room, I had, my dad set up 12 folding chairs. Uh, my mom made triangle sandwiches. She even cut off the crusts. It was a really big deal. And this is the box I made. So then I pulled up the box and it's a cardboard box that has crudely written on it, magic show on the face of it. So I pull out the box, put it on, put it on my uh, stool. And then, and then I reenact basically this, the trick that I did, which is essentially I take five jumbo cards, count them out, one, two, three, four, five, drop one in the box, snap my fingers. And there's still one, two, three, four, five. Now this is where there's the call. There's a callback that happens three times in this effect. So the first, the first thing is because it's a test of them, I go, uh, I say, you know, the cards, toss one card away card came back one two three four five the whole audience was so impressed they pumped their fist in the air and cried out the word amazing that and i re i act that out so everyone can see what i'm doing physically and then i wait for them to respond now usually the response is you know it's it's scattered at best most people don't know what to expect they don't know what they're supposed to be doing and then eventually they'll catch on and then i will say you know Okay, there's a timing issue. There's an energy issue with you guys. We need to do it again. You didn't know what to expect. And uh, I'm going to make it more exciting. And then I turn the box around. And now it's an even more crudely written and poorly spelt magic show. And I say, I was six years old. And in my parents' basement, there was 40, 50 people down there sitting on folding chairs, eating triangle sandwiches. And then I take the cards again, toss two cards away. And there's still one, two, three, four, five. Everyone pumped their fists in the air and cried with the word amazing. So now we're getting the second call back. And now most people are on board. They don't, they know what to expect. And then, um, but then I say, well, we are so close, guys. I'll tell you right now, everything was great. Except one person, I'm not going to mention names, didn't have their hand all the way up. And they've ruined it for all of us. We're going to do one last time. So then I do one more. Then I turn over the box uh, a third time. And I say... I was two years old and now it's just scribble on the other side of the box. So that magically appears and um, that gets a laugh obviously. And then I go like okay, one, two, three, four, five. And now I toss away about 12 cards. It's not 12 cards, but I kind of miscount and add some, add some numbers. It's not my fingers. There's still five, all the cards go inside the box. And then the box um, has no bottom and I poke my hand through it. So the cards are gone. And I say, 
uh, and the cards disappeared, and everyone said, "Amazing!" So that's, and then I'm in applause cue position, you know, with my hands out, whatever. So the reason why this is second is because it's sort of my origin story of into magic. I, I know it's not special; it's probably not, and it's not new. It's I'm, there's magicians around the globe who've been affected by the magic set that they got at Christmas, but I feel like this is the question that audience members will ask. So how'd you get into this? What happened? What, you know, were you bit by a spider? Like what happened? So for this is like, this is the, it is the answer to that question. And it also like the champagne over now they're physically involved. They're um, verbally involved. They are listening. They're interacting. I've held their attention. Now I'm keeping their attention. Um, and this is, and this is the beauty of it. So it's, it's really a strong, um, I'll be honest with you, it's a crutch for me. The five card box, I use this every every opportunity in every single show and every single scenario. If I have if I have to do 10 minutes, you know, for you know, I, I actually literally just had to do 10 minutes for a uh, a very large, like 400 seat banquet. And this is my op this is my well, my secondary, I guess you'd call it. I call it my opener, but because I, I think the champagne opener is actually it's more of an effect, but this is the actual opener because they get to know me. I you can do it in front of four hundred people. You can do it in front of forty people. You can I used I used to do it all the time in living rooms when I used to do birthday parties. It really is a again like the champagne opener. You can do it surrounded. You know you can do it. Um, you can do it in any environment. You can do it up close. You can do it on a big stage, and. That's the other reason it's uh, part of my desert tricks because I'd be uh, I would be lost without it because I've done it for so long, and it's such a um, a piece that I feel like is connects me with the audience really instantly with oh they can imagine me as a small child doing this and it's a you know it's it's that feeling of ah oh, not cute even as a grown man it's uh... <laughs> yeah I think it sounds superb. And I'm noticing that the narrative that you give each trick seems really important. So like oh. the, the idea of having that box and then turning it around and then turning yeah. it back again and the whole story and the concept behind it, I, I'm not sure where your list is going to go, so I don't know if this is going to carry on, but so mm -hmm. far in those first two things, it's almost like a, a mini piece of theatre in itself in, in mm -hmm. each, each capacity. Yeah, I I remember um, one of a, a very strong, um, probably probably the most impactful voice or influence on me as a young man and growing up into magic and later on in life too was Eugene Berger and he always his what he always told me is like just make every trick a closer like you could close with that trick you could close I could literally close with any of the tricks on my list and with that in mind that makes that makes life so much easier when you have to do the magic castle and they want you to do 20 minutes and you're used to doing 60 minutes or 45 minutes. It's easy when someone says, Hey, can you do a TV spot? Yeah. I've got a trick that's three minutes long. That's going to kill in that TV spot because there's a beginning, a middle and an end and a real climax. Every trick here, you know, in my opinion has a climax that you could close a show with, or you could close a set with. And you could do, you know, in any environment again. So it's like, I feel like that closer mentality um, is something that that is kind of the thread throughout most of the magic that I do. I hope, to be honest with you, hope that most of the magic is that is that has that quality or that power that you could close it, close your your set or your, or your show with. Well, that makes me excited for where this is going to go. Um, so, what's in your third position? Third position is uh, Poker Face, which is a uh, variation of a tossed out deck routine. Um, and I first read about this concept was in David Ben had a book, had wrote a book called Tricks, which is kind of his professional repertoire um, uh, kind of revealed. And in that, he, he, uh, I think he called it tossed on stage. So the concept, which I had never seen anybody else do, was that you bring people on stage for the toss out deck as opposed to throwing the deck out into the audience. So you so in and that's that's where ours, you know, that's that's the 
the origin of that, uh, I took it in a different direction a little bit. And rather than mind reading, I did it as a poker tell reading demonstration. So I brought, would, so anyways, I'll explain the effect. Uh, the opening line is, did you know? So actually the opening line is, my segue between the five card box and that is that after my big debut, you know, I went through school, I got a degree in psychology. And then um, after four years of psychology, I'd like to show you something, actually show you the one thing that I learned in four years of psychology. And that is that it's physically impossible to maintain a poker face during a high stakes game of poker, because as human beings, we all have a tell. And if I can figure out your tell, I can probably beat you at poker. So that's the premise. Then uh, we'll kick on some music and I will go out to the audience and say, I'm looking for some stone face killers, some guys here that uh, no stranger to a casino. Let's see who we can find. So then I'm pulling up five guys from the audience and I bring them up and I'll say, now girls, I know this is a sexist decision. The reason I do this, I choose five men is because um, it's more of a challenge to me because men are visually bereft of any real human emotion about uh, 60 percent of the time. Anyway, so 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 that's the premise. I get the five guys up and now um, now I get to know them. So now I have a whole segment where I, I ask each guy a different question. I'll ask the first guy, what's your favorite color? What your answer is going to tell me all kinds of things about you. He says blue. I said, oh, you like wide open spaces. You like you like a peaceful lifestyle. Um, in fact, you know, I wore the blue suit just because I knew you were coming, blah, blah, blah. So that's that's the first question. And then down the line, I ask a different question and it reveals something humorous about each person. I ask person, one person, you know, if they make a Hollywood movie of your life and you get to choose the Hollywood actor that plays the part of you, who's it going to be? Um, how do you drink your coffee? How do you, you know, what's your favorite animal? So all of these things reveal things. And that's, I would say that's the probably the first five minutes of the routine, five to six minutes of the routine is just asking these questions, going down the row. Um, and then, uh, then I pull out a deck of cards and I walk down the row and they each peek at a card in the deck. And so now, and then I have a moment where they all stare off into something like onto the chandelier in the middle of the ballroom or whatever. And then I, I basically call out the cards and with the premise of, I'm going to read your poker tell. So maintain that poker face, no matter what happens. So then they have various degrees of being able to do that. Some there's always a giggler in the group that's you know laughing his head off. And there's always the stone faced guy who does not move, you know. And I have you know bits of business for each each one of those uh, experiences. And then um, I and then after I you know apparently read their tells, I say okay, I've got I've got five cards. I'm going to call out call them out. If you hear your card, go go back to your seat. I'll call up the five cards. Four guys sit down. One guy's still on stage, and um, and the finish is that I say that he was a bit more of a tougher cookie. I'm going to have to try something a bit more physical with you if that's okay. And then I just hold my hand out and he takes my hand. So now we're holding hands on stage, um, which always gets, a, you know, it's always gets a great response. And then I, and then I do, do the round one more time of calling out the cards. And then I say, I, mean, I think I've got it. I'm going to call it out. If I, if I get your card, I want you to, to let go of my hand and take your seat. If you, if I didn't get the card, just continue to hold my hand lovingly the way that you have been. So then I say, your card was the three of clubs. He lets go of my hand, takes a seat. And that's the, that's the finish. So it's, there's a lot going on in this trick. The beauty of it is, in my opinion, what I love about it is the, it's, it's fill it's filling the stage with people. People are ultimately interested in people. So for this effect, by bringing five guys up, asking them their name, asking them a particular personal question about themselves, they're re they're revealing that. Um, that to me is what. If you're not doing magic, what do you you know? You can tell a story, which can be interesting, but I feel like people are ultimately in and they're also they're also mostly interested in themselves. So bringing people up and then asking them these questions, you know. It take it because I have these guys up for a long time. It'd be like eight minutes, ten minutes sometimes, depending on the the juice I get out of the routine. So um, making them feel comfortable, so they're laughing and having a good time, and um, and also I'm taking the piss out of everybody. So it's not just you know it's not not just one guy or anything. It's it's like it's like they're they're there as a gang. So it's, it's it makes it a little bit easier to take if you know 
um, if I have some improv that, you know, <laughs> that, uh, that beats them up a little bit, but it's, it's fun. And then I've had people come up to me afterwards, like believing that what I did was real, which is, which is really the whole point. So this is not magic. I would say this is like a stunt or a skill, a skill demonstration, which I think, which I also think is important. I think it's important to show like, oh my gosh, how, how did he do that? You know? And I feel like the poker face thing um, and the way that the methodology is uh, I have the ability to always have one person on stage at the end, you know, after I call out the five cards, there's always one person still on stage and that, that sells it even harder. That sells it even more. Cause now there's one guy still on stage and I'm using that, um, uh, using that moment to, um, to really sell the fact that it's real. I think that's what's really happening is that, wow, it's, there's still a guy, he didn't get that guy. Oh, this is crazy. You know, that's like, Oh, he screwed up, you know, and now I made it better, you know, closing with a good thing, but it, it, I just feel like it adds to the authenticity of the premise that I'm actually reading tells. Yeah. I, what I love about that as well is normally a tossed out deck. The focus is on the performer. And I know that you have participants stood up in the audience, but it's not really about the participants because the rest of the audience can't see them objectively from the front. So by bringing yeah. them on stage, not only does it highlight the people on the stage and makes mm -hmm. them the the focus, but it also means that the rest of the audience can then interact and watch for those same tells and, and be more involved. I think the intimacy of bringing the guys up on stage too, there's a, there's a certain camaraderie that happens. And like you said, when you can't see their faces, you can't see them react. You can't see their, you know... Um, I mean, I've been in the audience for many tossed out deck routines. And if you're in a bad, you're a bad seat, you can't see everything. So when you say everybody sit down who heard their card, there's going to be a couple of people that are, did they sit down? Did that guy sit down? I can't see that guy. Did he sit down? It's really terrible staging. It's, it's not good. Um, it works and it kills. And that's why we still do it. But I think by bringing the guys on stage, there's such a strong, signal that you've read their minds or you've read their poker tells or whatever your premise happens to be when they physically leave the stage and you have a much longer time to get a longer applause cue because you know when when those guys are sitting down you know and you can even juice it so like you know you get a nice solid 30 you know maybe 20 seconds of applause you say come on give it up for these guys you know whatever and then you're extending that and then the last guy it always gets a great response um gets a bigger response because it's like, oh, he pinpointed that exact card, a crazy, blah, blah, blah. And I feel like, again, you're seeing visibly what's happening. Like when I named the card, you can see like, I got, uh, he got it. You know, like you can see his, his slight dejection, the fact that I was able to get the card he was thinking of. And it's in, in a good way, but it's like, and then I'll high five him or whatever afterwards. But it's, it's just that moment. And I feel like bringing it up on stage Again, David Ben's genius is that you bring it up on stage, everyone can see it. And out in the audience, it's just, and depending on the audience, like you, you could do the toss of deck for a smaller group, maybe 50 people or maybe 100. But as soon as you get bigger than that, it's sometimes hard. It's very hard to see. It's just very hard to see the people standing uh, from every from every seat. So bringing the people up on stage, I feel, is just smarter um, staging, in my opinion. Uh, earlier on you mentioned that each one is a closer it's yeah. interesting to understand where you're gonna <laughs> where you're gonna go after each one because that that feels like such a powerful yeah, so trick it, it, and this is like if someone says to me i need you to do 10 minutes at a banquet or you know at the end of a same same dude close-up magic at a wedding i'll bring the groomsmen up and we'll do it with the groomsmen and you know kills i mean because you're you're making fun of them. You're having fun with the, you know, and it's, it's so, it's so strong. And again, you can just close it. You can just do that trick. You just do that effect, that routine. And I feel like, again, this is another crutch, a crutch for me in terms of like, it's a stage filling routine with a deck of cards that fits in my pocket. You can't, can't beat it for 10, like you got 10 minutes of entertainment and it's real entertainment. It's not like entertainment where I say jokes that nobody laughs at. And it's, it's actually really entertaining. And because, because you're dealing with people and you're having their reactions to, 
to questions and answers and making it fun. Superb. Uh, so that brings us to your halfway point. Um, this is your fourth effect. What's in your fourth position? I'm going to change the order. I'm going to s- switch it out because I, I looked at it now and I'm like, you know what? This is not the way I would do it. So I'm I'm not changing any of the any of the any of the effects, but I am changing the the order. So the next up, I'm going to say is the uh, the center tear. Um, <laughs> Which is uh, which? Is funny. It's funny that we. It's, it's my center tear routine, which is kind of like. That's how it's working. <laughs> that's how it's done. <laughs> anyways, anyways, I'm gonna do center tear. Center tear is next. So after the five guys sit down, there's a moment of pause or whatever. Maybe there's some music, and then I then I will say. I do know what you're thinking to yourself. You're thinking, "Wow, he just read the minds of five men, but can he do the impossible?" And I just let that sit. I don't say, uh, I don't say anything else. And that always generates a laugh because all, all the women are like, yeah. You know? <laughs> so then I say, I'd like to get weird with someone here tonight. Not in the way that you're thinking, sir. I'm actually going to try to pick out a personal thought from someone here tonight. And then I, 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 uh, uh, I'll choose a, a, a lady uh, female, and I'll say, uh, we've never met before. We didn't prearrange anything. Uh, we're not Facebook friends, anything like that. I'd like to like you to, and this is, this is actually quite, this, this effect will be far, far less jokes. This will be more, um, just more of a serious thing. It, serious for me anyways. There's always something that is humorous that I do, but I, this is a, for me, it's more of a, um, a serious routine. And then essentially I, I get her to think of someone close to her heart in some way. She writes it down. She shows it to one other person who's going to be the witness. And then we tear it up, toss the pieces away. And, and just, I ask her some simple yes or no questions. And I reveal the name of the person she's thinking of. And then depending on the environment um, at my hotel show, I have a, I have a can of tea that's used in another routine that'll open up and show that there's a note inside, which he removes. And inside is, is a basically a prediction saying, um, I have a sneaking suspicion. Someone's going to focus on the name Rebecca or whatever the name is that she's thinking that's, and that's, um, that's kind of on stage throughout the, throughout the routine. If I do a corporate show, I will pull out my wallet and pull out the, a pad of paper and a pen and hand her the wallet to hold. And then when I do the whole thing and she uses the wallet to kind of write the, um, as kind of a, a pad or like a, a, a surface to write the, her, her name on. And then later on, um, that prediction will be inside the wallet that she's holding from the beginning. So that's, um, that's a, you know, a W two WTF moment in the show that's really strong. It's like a, it's like a powerful trick that doesn't it doesn't rely on humor as sort of the vehicle. It's it really I really play it straight. I do not. There's not a lot of uh, gags or jokes or there's small things, but um, but nothing. Uh, so that's kind of like what I might in my opinion a really strong, hard hitting um, routine that. Again, it goes back to like powerful magic, you know. Um, I used to do the center tear for years without a prediction ending. And after I I overheard someone talking uh, after a show once and they were like, well, I don't know how he did it, but obviously he saw what she wrote down. And so I was thinking about like, yeah, that's so true. Like it, it makes sense if you're thinking of it rationally, you're like, he never, if he really didn't meet her before and he really doesn't know who her daughter's name is, he never met them before. And she writes it down and he doesn't have powers. Like he says he, he, that he doesn't. <laughs> how, how else is he finding out who she is, who, who the name is, what the name is? So by having that prediction ending, it sort of cleans that up a little bit in the sense that he might have, he didn't know how to do it. He was sorry, he didn't know what the name was, but even if he, even if he peeked at that, how how was it inside the tin can at the end how did that happen so like i feel like helps to cancel out um the methodology but 
what I've noticed already as well is you've started your set with a really energetic opening moment where everyone's involved and then you sort of bring it down a little bit with your five card box which i know that you have everyone punch in the air but yep. it, it brings it down and then you bring it back up again with poker face with everyone yep. being involved and now you have sort of the the mid-level where p- people are going to really hone in and really listen to what you're saying now there's this is a real really what i would could, could call a a truly intimate trick because you're really you're you're focusing in and, and the people that they think of so i i the way i word it i say i want you to think of someone close to your heart in some way someone who who you have an emotional connection to and then the other thing i say is like but nobody who's in this room right now for whatever reason a lot of a lot of women will write down someone who's passed on they'll write down their grandmother their aunt their mother their father for whatever reason, that's that seems to be a direction that it goes. And I, for the first bunch of years I did the did the center terror, I didn't I wasn't comfortable with it. So I would always say, like, but someone and someone who's still, you know, with us, someone who's still living or whatever. And I would always tag that, you know, think of someone close to your heart in some way, someone who's still alive, someone who's whatever. I have recently taken that out and I let them think of whoever the heck they want. And if they want to think of their their uncle who's passed on, they have an emotional connection. To it. And I found, I found that, you know, through a lot of, a lot of help uh, coaching from my wife, she said, it's, it's really strong and healing for people to be able to think of someone who's passed on. And even if it's in this public forum and of a magic show, it seems cheesy, but the reality is they're having an emotional moment, which is actually healthy and good. And it, and I, and so I've had, many women crying on stage, which is, I I think is, it's a powerful thing. And like, I don't take it lightly. I don't take it as, you know, as something that I think is, I don't try to do it. I don't, you know, and I don't, obviously I don't milk it, but it is one of those things that I feel like it can really bring, can really stop the show in a good way, in a powerful way that, you know, they're having a lovely memory and, you know, so for those reasons, um, the center is again very strong, and it's a piece of paper and a pen in your pocket. That's it. It's very. It's hard to beat. Hello, guys. I'm here to talk to you about Alakazam Unlimited. This is the best streaming platform in the world. I'm telling you now. With Alakazam Unlimited, you get access to over 150 magic routines. This is video performances and explanations. We have card magic, coin magic, kids magic, rope magic, mentalism, stage, parlor, impromptu. We've got you covered. All of this for the low price of just £4.99 a month. And you can cancel at any time. Perfect if you've got commitment issues. Yes, I'm talking to you. Guys, you are going to absolutely love it. If you haven't joined the platform already, what the heck are you doing? Alakazam Unlimited is a streaming platform that you need to be a part of. Not only that, there is also exclusive content only available on the platform. Check it out now, alakazam.co.uk. Cheers. Um, so that brings us on to your fifth position, just over your halfway point. What's in your fifth position? So right after uh, she reads out that prediction in the in the in the center of terror team, where it's like she, it, that reveals um, the name that's been sitting in a prediction um, on stage, and I and I and I seat her as soon as basically as soon as that as soon as she's seated, I have this i think it's martin denny or it was it's a it's like a tiki vibe you know jungle uh style music that kicks in and i i go to my prop case and i pull out what looks like a it's a it's a it's a bag that you'd get at one of those new age shops it's hard to explain but it's like one of those bags that clearly looks like you know your crazy aunt has arrived with uh with her crystals (laughs) but anyways i pull out the i pull out this bag and I start shaking it and there's obviously there's some kind of sh- shaker inside or something and I, and I start to shake it over the audience like I'm blessing them or something and then I unzip it and the music's quite loud so it's like and then I pull out I pull out a, a small maraca 
and I hand it to somebody, I hand it to some, a, a guy in the front row and I say, you know, shake along to the music. So he's shaking the music. Then I have another, it's like a bracelet that goes around. That's like, if you shake it, you, it, it it's another noisemaker and I give it to somebody else. And then I have one of those drums that if you, you between your hands, if you, uh, you, you, you spin it between your hands, it, it hits the, it, it has little uh, balls on strings that hits the, the both sides of the drum really, really fast. And I hand it to somebody else. So now I have three people all doing that. And then I, uh, I invite a lady on stage, and while the music's playing, I'm I'm setting her up. I say, well, hold up both hands, make two fists, drop one, hold one close to your heart, and I'll, I'm kind of doing this with her um, while we um, while the music's playing. So that's in the background, and then I and I get her to stand. So now she's standing. One fist she's chosen is close to her heart, and she's. Um, standing on stage facing the audience and then I I I the music fades down and then I I signal the uh the guys to stop the instruments by you know doing the, the throat cut with my hand and um and then I I ask the lady her name and I say Rebecca have you ever been part of a voodoo ceremony before she reacts yes no whatever it's like now the only thing you need to know is that I'm not going to touch you I'm not going to come near you, mostly for legal reasons. But the important thing is that if you don't move, this won't hurt. And ladies and gentlemen, every voodoo ceremony that I've ever seen in the movies always has three components. They always have the strange and terrible rhythms of the voodoo orchestra. Give it up, guys. So now I'm signaling the guys to start playing. So they start rattling their instruments. And then I do the other. I do the cut the throat move again. You know, and then there's always a guy who who doesn't stop, who makes it funny, and uh, or keeps going, and then I have to you know, <laughs> rapidly do it, and then right after that, uh, then I'll say something like, you know, it's their first rehearsal; they didn't know what they're doing yet, and then I'll say the, the second component in every uh, in every voodoo ceremony is 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 always a there's always involves a vic a volunteer who comes out of the audience, so I do that victim volunteer gag, and then. I and I said the third component is always a voodoo doll. So then I have a, a small cigarette case I pull out and there's a little voodoo doll, a little straw doll. And then I say, now the objective is this. We're going to try to excite the spirit in the voodoo doll to life. And the only way to do that, of course, is with the strange and terrible rhythms of the voodoo orchestra. Take it away, guys. So now they're playing. The voodoo dolls on my hand and then as they play and i say faster louder guys and as they do that it starts to rise up and it's standing on my hand now once it gets upright i then produce uh produce a match for my lapel i light the arm of the voodoo doll that bursts into flames and sparks and then i snap my fingers and the voodoo doll falls over and i give signal the guys to to cut the music say ladies and gentlemen the voodoo ceremony is complete but we will we will only know the voodoo ceremony has worked if the mark has been cast. Rebecca, did you feel anything? She says, no. I said, that's good. It's voodoo. And then I I say, do this with me. And then I, I get her to, I say, do the accompaniment of the voodoo orchestra. Do this with me, Rebecca. So the, the guys start playing again. And then I I signal her to, to remove her hand from her heart and slowly open her fist so she can see it. So then she reacts to now there's an ash in the center of her palm. And then I show, then I, I grab her arm and she kind of show everybody kind of do a wide arc across the audience so everyone could see uh, what it is. Yeah. So that's, and that's, that's uh, it's a nice palate cleanser up to the center chair. It's still like a powerful trick of like, how in the world? Like, and then I also, and before she opens her hand, I say, now remember, you know, if you remember, I didn't touch you, didn't come near you. Is that correct? She says, yes. So again, hammering home the, the mystery of it. Um, yeah, and then then I see her. I gather up the instruments, and I you know one more round of applause for the incredible you know voodoo orchestra, which uh, which is great. Collect all those instruments, toss them in the toss them away. So that's 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 the the voodoo ash routine. Again, it's like the ash on palm is something I've been doing for probably the, one of the longest tricks I've ever done. Probably 25, 30 years almost, probably, which is a long time. Um, in every kind of scenario, I've done it. You know, in bars and restaurants and walk around and on big stages never fails to get a great response and this is just and for me this is a really fun routine because it's just playing 
the method methodology is so simple that it's just me having fun and the audience having fun too. Um, and, and also involving, you know, four different people in the audience. I think, um, you know, in my hotel show that I do weekly, I try to involve every single person in the audience. And if we have 25 people, um, that's going to, you know, th th it's a pretty busy show. So like the Voodoo Astro team, for example, you know, there's three guys that weren't involved in any of the tricks yet. Now they're playing his musical instruments. So now those three people have been quote unquote part of the show. And I feel like that's what I've tried to do with all these routines is like, how can I involve the most amount of people um, while still, you know, making it sense to, to the routine and, and uh, without losing, you know, heavy process time and all that stuff on stage. I love the um, instruments. I think that's excellent. Yeah, that's that's something something I've been doing for probably about three years, and uh, ever since I've started doing it, it's like it has taken the routine in a really fun direction. Because on its own, it's kind it, you know it's as much as I play it up for campiness. It, it, before the instruments, it didn't have the same humor, but now when you got three guys, it's like kindergarten class with with everyone's like banging on you know banging their sticks together and you know hitting things i, I feel like it's it, it's got that same vibe of like you know kind of a free-for-all which i love yeah <laughs> i just imagine if you got that one drunk spectator the oh noise that would yeah. come from them yeah no absolutely <laughs> absolutely and that's a, that's the thing it's that's what's fun it's like yeah and again that that's a routine that can go for like three minutes or five minutes, depending on the amount of, you know, interaction that they provide, you know, which is pretty fun. Yeah, it sounds great. And that leads us on to your sixth position. So what's in your sixth place? So I'm going to switch it up again. Uh, I have one thing here that should not be there. And now I have, uh, so my next position will be uh, Pegasus page. The next chart, my next effect will be the Pegasus page. And this is a, a routine I've just kept been in and out of my repertoire for years and years, but now it's kind of a staple that's in every show. And um, I do a show in Florida. We live in Florida. Florida has all kinds of, you know, wonderful, it's, it's a beautiful place to live, but it does have a massive reputation, especially in the States and all around the world whether it's Florida man or whether the political scenarios and uh, the, the nonsense that goes on down here. Um, so my opening line for this effect is like, does anyone, does anyone read here? Does anyone read books? Are you guys allowed to? And I, which also gets, which gets, a bit, <laughs> which gets a big laugh from especially Floridians. Cause were, you know, we're always, there's always obviously a perception that's in the media. That's very different than, um the reality that i that i have anyways but so anyways that's that's a very it's that's a great open a great funny line and i pull out a book and i say um i say i'm looking for some and then i say and then someone will put up their hands like does anyone read books i mean really like physical books you read them you 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 know crack a spine and and and, and get into something and they'll, they'll be like guys and girls whatever so I'll, I'll pick someone out and say oh what kind of books are you into what kind of what kind of genre you know so so then I have a little interaction with the, the person about the genre book that they like. And they say, one of my favorite stories, um, it happened about the same time I started magic was, uh, I got a, I got a book about the adventures of Sherlock Holmes. And I pull out that book and I say, he was kind of like a magician. He had this ability to like, you know, put all these pieces together and figure out, you know, the, the criminals or the, the people that committed these crimes. Um, it almost seemed like magic because he was using the power of deduction and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so I, I do a brief, a very brief sort of intro to that. I bring uh, the person up, could be a man or woman, and uh, who I've just interacted with about the book, and I have them uh, sit in a chair and then I hand them the book. They check it out. I say, how many pages is it? It's like 400 pages. Okay, so we have 400 chances, 400 different options. I'm going to flip through the book with one hand, uh, well, looking away, you say stop when you want. They say stop and they say, I'm going to mark the page. And all I want you to do, I'm going to open the book when you're going to remember the page number and the, and the first word on the page. So the page number is the very top and the first word is just below the page number. I want you to remember both those things. 
I'll also mention that I, I usually try to say, like, do you need glasses to read before they come up? So that they're not, then after they're not like, you know, having to go back to their seat to get their purse and all that stuff. So anyways, so they then, I open the book, they remember the page number, the word, I get them to hold the book. And then I go out into the audience and sit in their chair and say, I'm going to try to read your mind. I'm going to start with the word. So I want you to think of a letter somewhere in the middle of the word. Have you got, have you got a letter in the middle of the word in your mind? Yes. So then I reveal that. Then I reveal the second letter, the letter after that, the last letter, the first letter, and then I reveal the actual word. And then I say, let's go for the number. So then I reveal the page number. And then after I reveal the page number, I say, you know what the weird thing is? It's page 158 with the word objects on it. Doesn't even exist in that book. So that's a moment of like, uh, you know, like, what? Well, and then... And the, and the person on stage is like, I just saw, what do you mean? <laughs> so then they they instantly, without any coaxing, then start looking through the book to see if they, you know, I saw it, it's in here. So then they go through it, they open the book, there is no page number. Or, sorry, there's no page, it's been ripped out. They, and they, and, I, and then, then that's when I go back on stage, I pick up the book and I show the page torn. And I say, you know what the weird thing is? Is where it is now. Now it always gets a big like, Oh my gosh, you know, it's, women will check their, you know, check their bras and, <laughs> you know, whatever. And I say, uh, and then uh, um, I'm trying to remember what my next line is. It's something, it's something, something similarly funny where it's like, uh, um, I say, anyway, so, so I lead to the point where I said, please stand up. She's, he or she stands up. And then there's an envelope that wasn't there when they sat down earlier sitting on the chair, they pick it up, they open it up and inside is the page. And then, um, so that's the, that's the end of the trick. I thank them. They, they sit down and then I take the torn page, put it inside the book. And then I inscribe the book to them and then hand it to them as a gift. So they get to take the book home with them, which I, which is very strong. That moment is actually my favorite part of the whole trick, <laughs> which is, a, it's silly, but the fact that they can take the book home, I feel is a really great, it's a, I mean, if you look at it from a magical point of view, it's a huge selling, selling point that it's like, how in the world, like any, you know, it's obviously not a tricky book. You know, I'm getting to take it home, which is, I think is also very strong. And it's a nice gesture that they now have a book on their, on their shelf and they have a memory that they can take home with them too, which is cool. Uh, exactly what you just said. It's the whole giving it back is a really nice, subtle way of saying, this is a normal book without, you know, testifying. Yeah. This is a normal, ordinary book. And I guarantee, yeah. I mean, you'll have to tell me yeah. that after the show, that whoever you've given that book to must have other spectators going up to them and asking about the book to see it and to, to oh, experience absolutely. it. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, I've toyed with the idea of putting the page back in and putting it back together and all this stuff, but I feel like it's much stronger if it stays torn. Um, but yeah, I, it, it's crazy. People, uh, you know, we do a meet and greet after the show, um, in my, in my weekly show. And it's one of those things where they're always posing with the book and you know, like with, for the photos. And it's just one of those things that like, I know that they're taking it home with them. It's just a cool, it's just a really cool moment. And I found a, I found a beautiful addition that's like, it's not leather, but it has that leather look and it looks like a really nice a, a book that you would put on your shelf and it would, you know, even if you never read, it makes you look like you're smart. One of those books. <laughs> and what an amazing story, like having having that in their living room when they have friends over that yeah. story of this. This is what happened with this book and, and yeah. explaining that totally. the, te the page wasn't there. I think it would be incredible. Um, but that brings us over your, no, onto the tail end of your eight tricks now. So we're on yeah. to number seven. Yes, sir. So number seven is the bill in lime. And uh, yeah, so there's something that happens during my show that's not on this list, but um, you'll have to believe me. <laughs> During the show, there's a moment in the show where I talk about a dream that I have. I had the night before the show, and it's strangely enough, there's a woman sitting here that looks exactly like the woman that was in my dream. And so I go, I go through sort of this this dream sequence, and then at the end of it, um, I produce 
align. That's part of the dream. The part of the dream is that we're on this beach and the, there's a tree shading us and there's a, there's, it's a lime tree and the lime falls out of the tree and knocks me in my head. And instantly I, I wake up and I'm, I'm still in bed and I, I thought it was real. And then I make the lime appear. So then I, and then I, I hand it to her and said, you know, we've been through a lot, Samantha, would you hold my fruit? So then I, I hand her the lime. So now she's holding that. And that's, that would happen in the middle of the show or near the beginning of the show. So that's out in the audience. So then I, that obviously the audience is at the point that we're doing this routine now, they've forgotten about the fact that, you know, the lime's out there in the audience. Uh, so now I say, uh, before you go, I have to show you, I show you, I have to show you my favorite trick. It's called the $1 mystery and it only costs a dollar. So then I just wait and pause and everyone's like, uh-huh, what, you know, say, so could be anybody's dollar, you know, anybody here, anybody here have a dollar, check inside your purse, your man purse, your fanny packs, whatever you got your bunny in, just reach inside there. Anybody's dollar, first person with a hand in the air with a dollar, that's the person, that's the dollar we're going to use. So that's what happens. Somebody pulls out a dollar. I grab the dollar and say, come on up. And sometimes depending on, it, I will just borrow the dollar. If there's a, if there's a kid in the audience, some, at the hotel show we do we uh we do weekly it's it's geared towards adults but occasionally like families will will purchase tickets um and i will uh, this is a trick i will bring up a um a, a, a child for if there's a kid in the audience that's you know so this is, the, this is the trick that i would bring up a kid for that um but for the most part whoever brings holds the bill up is that's the person i bring up and then um two things happen one is i get the i get them to sign the bill i get them to memorize the serial number but i i get the audience to call the serial number out so that way everyone rem can remember the serial number and then i take the uh i take the bill we roll it up there's all kinds of jokes about that and then we put it under a handkerchief and now we're going to make the bill disappear he's going to say a magic word and if the bill disappears we got to go crazy for dave or whoever it is dave how, have you ever had a standing ovation in your life he says no or if he says yes it doesn't matter I say, ladies and gentlemen, if that bill disappears, this is the first trick he's ever done in a magic show. We got to go crazy for Dave. I think we should be on our feet, just clapping and cheering for Dave. What do you think? Yay, whatever. So now I'm, I'm kind of juicing a, a standing ovation for him. So he lets go. He says his magic word. Let's go. The bill it disappears, and the audience goes crazy, standing ovation, whatever. So then, uh, and then they sit down, and I say, Dave, did you feel anything when it disappeared? Because it's it teleported all the way to the fourth dimension. So then I say, moved all the way to the back of the room. And I'm now I'm pointing at Samantha. Samantha, did you feel anything over there? Other than embarrassment, as I wiggled my fingers at you, did you feel anything? And I said, do you still have my fruit? So this is the moment where I say, do you still have my fruit? She says, yes. And this is where the audience goes, oh, come on. Because now they're already, they already, if you've done the bill and bill and anything, but if the bill and fruit, bill and lemon, bill and whatever, there's always that moment where, when they see the fruit or they think that they and a bill has disappeared it's like come on and what's strong about this obviously is that she's already in the audience and now she's bringing it up so i get her to come up and uh i have some byplay about you know where do you buy your fruit you know etc cetera, etc cetera. and then i say um a lot of people a lot of skeptics you know this this is this is the trick that bothers them the most and they'll be lying awake in bed staring at the ceiling till about two in the morning and then they say to themselves, you know what? Probably came out of his sleeve. I don't want anyone sleeping tonight. Do me a favor, Dave, grab one of my wrist, two hands, do the same, Samantha. So now they're holding onto my wrists as I cut open the lime. So I cut open the lime, Bill's inside. We confirm everything, blah, blah, blah. You know, big reaction. And then I then they then they're seated. So that's that's the Bill and Lime routine. Again, another very powerful thing that has a lot of jokes and and um situations where but it's again it's situational comedy with the person that you know um volunteers the money and if it's a kid it's a big deal because they're doing their very first magic show magic trick and you know they're going to be my best student let's make sure they get a huge round of you know huge standing ovation if they get this right whatever so that's that's a really nice way to um showcase somebody and if it's somebody's birthday if it's someone's you know, if it's a, you could have the bride come up and do it at a wedding or something like that, where you're trying to showcase someone in, in a, in a big way where making them feel 
uh, feel good, but also showcasing them in front of a whole crowd. It's really good at a corporate event. It could be the you know person getting a promotion or the whatever the the president of the company. And it's it's anyways it's a, it's a strong trick. Again, it's one of those it's one of those effects that's um, for people that hire me. It's kind of synonymous with. The, the magic show they were like you're gonna do that one right you're gonna do the one with with the, with the fruit and the money so that's that's a big uh it's a big it's a big um reputation maker for me it has been for many years and like i've tried to drop it but <laughs> it doesn't seem to work it seems to be one of those things like it's like it's it's one of those money tricks and in in more ways than one it's a really strong trick yeah and i love the the getting uh getting them to hold your sleeves shut I think that's really mm -hmm. clever for one of two things. A, because it really is highlighting what I presume some people must think is the method. Yeah. Someone um, called it. Someone called it out in a show. Someone actually yelled it out like seven, seven, eight years ago. Said it was in his sleeve, and like it, people laughed and people. But it, it, then it then it just and it dawned on me like, oh yeah, I never considered that would be a thought because it seems so clean like what when i'm doing it that like you couldn't possibly be in the sleeve you know, quote unquote but what's cool about it what's cool about that notion though is that that's what people are thinking so that's what i'm going to try to try to take off the list of possible <laughs> possible methods and the other beautiful thing about it was something that happened by accident it was when you do it and it, and this is not new like, like you've you've probably seen you know, people do the egg bag, for example, and they get people to hold their wrists as they go inside the egg bag and pull out the egg and do all that. Um, so it's not something that's you know new to me. But what is what I like about it for the bill in line is it focuses attention so well because those people that are holding your wrists are very close to you. And when you see that on stage or you see that, you know, from an audience perspective, it really and because of the way that they're holding your wrists it's actually it's two big arrows pointing at the action and so it's a really even though it's a tiny really a small tiny piece they have to look at a small three inch square of space <laughs> to see what's actually happening um just that simple staging with them holding your wrists uh really focuses the attention really well yeah it makes it so much more theatrical as well the the restriction of, yeah. of your movements and everything as well really elevates that moment even more, yeah. I would expect. But goodness knows where you're going to go now um, because that, <laughs> that really does feel like a, a full circle moment. I mean, in terms of a show, you gave the lime out at the beginning. Also, you mm -hmm. mentioned that in, in your patter, you're on an island and one drops on, on your head. So, you know, that's perfect <laughs> for this podcast. Um, yeah, yeah, perfect. So who knows where you're going to go next? So what is in your final position? What's in your eighth position? So I'll be honest with you. The Bill and Lime that I just did, which was number seven, technically that is the closer to the show. I don't ever close with it, but technically that is the mystery that they're going to go home with predominantly in their mind because it's, it, it is so strong and the staging of it, it's so um so memorable that i it's it's the it is the one that I, i've actually tried to drop it i did a brand new show last spring but i had to put it back in because people kept asking for it it's weird that we get you know it's rare i think in magic not rare but i think it's one of those things that like if you have favorites the audience favorites like really think twice about losing them from your show because even though you're bored with them and I mean, if you do a trick really well, people can see it multiple times and still have no idea how it's done. And I feel it's really important that, um, yeah, that you keep tricks in that you're that that really do that. I'm talking about I'm not talking about you know TV shows and something. I'm talking about a working performer doing shows, you know, live shows. But um, the Bill and Lime is actually my closer, but my this what I, this is what I would call my encore effect. So this is a prediction effect. Um, in the theater that we do, that we, that we, in our weekly show, um, we have a VIP cocktail hour. And during that cocktail hour, there is a large, uh, black, uh, envelope that our hostess carries around, um, at one point in the evening and has a gold, um, metallic pen that everyone signs it. So the whole audience uh, signs this envelope and then, um, 
when they come into the, the, the small theater, there's, it's hanging on a, on a uh, stand in the middle of the, in, at the front. So it sits through the whole show. And so they know that they've, they felt that they've touched it. They've signed it. It's been sitting there the whole show. So uh, after the bill and lime, I see the people and then I have some music kick in. I usually do like kind of a front of curtain speech at that point and talk to them about make sure you write a review and don't forget we do private parties and, you know, nonsense, nonsense. And then I say, and then I have music kick in and I say, there's one more. And then I go over, I point to the envelope, I go over to it, take it off. And then um, I say, uh, there's something mysterious inside this envelope and we are all going, I'm going to, I'm going to, I need the most psychic person here tonight to sense what that is. So, I'm, and then I point to someone. So now again, like I said, I try to involve as many people as possible. I try to involve everyone as you know, in the show at some point. And so now I'm going to go for the one guy or girl who has not been part of the show at all, never been involved with any of the tricks. And I then hand them the envelope say, um, and what's your name? And she says, Stephanie. I say, you're not Stephanie tonight. You are psychic Stephanie. And psychic Stephanie is going to show her powers as she holds this envelope. The vibrations from what's inside that envelope are traveling through her fingers, into her arms, into her shoulders, into her brain, into her cerebral cortex. And in this moment, she's she knows things. She knows things she shouldn't know, but she knows things. And then I say, we're all going to go on an, an imaginary, all-inclusive vacation. And that, that's when I pull out, you're going to see these, but that's when I pull out my postcards. I have these four by six postcards. And I go through the postcards and show that there's, uh, we could go to any one of these places. We'd be going to Vienna. We could be going to New York City. We could be going to Austria. We could be going to Ireland. And I go through, you know, uh, about half the deck. And I say, um, I go through half the deck, but I, I, I say just before I show them, I say, by your reactions, I'm going to see where you want to go. So the first thing I show is like Canada. Who wants to go to Canada? And of course, one person maybe yell out, <laughs> like, "All right, we'll leave you here." And then I go, and then I then I go through. Uh, who wants to go to Hawaii? Who wants to go to Italy? Who wants to go to Costa Rica? Who wants to go to the exotic Boston? Anyone wants to go to? And I go. Then I have a, a few gag ones where it's like, "Who wants to go to boring Oregon? Who wants to go to Disappointment Island? That's a place in New Zealand. I've been there a few times this week." Um, then I have, and then I have a uh, who wants to go to hell. It's a place called Hell, Michigan. It says Hell. I say, or as we like to call it in, in Florida, Orlando. Anyways, so these are these are all these are all. That's obviously a local joke, but so that's always uh, fun. Gets good reactions, and then, um, then I take the take the postcards and, and uh, mix them up, and I go to the I go to the to the psychic spectator, psychic Stephanie, and I say, Stephanie, have you ever heard of a double blind test? That's where I poke both your eyes out before we continue. So that you're really using your seat. That's I'm not going to do that. But you're not going to look at these, at the faces of these. You're not going to know which which postcards which. But you can use your psychic powers. I'm going to hold some up high and some down low. Are we going to get rid of the highs or lows? Using your psychic powers, you make this decision. So she says high or low. We toss those away. Again, we do it again. I cut them in half. Again, we toss them away, and then we get down to a small handful. They say, Stephanie, please raise your most psychic finger high into the air. Of course, that's always gets a joke, a laugh, because she's she could obviously put up any finger, and they will. <laughs> and I say, take that finger, tap the one you feel most drawn to. She does. I say, if you hold it, I'll take the envelope back. And say, remember, she could have thought of any one of these dozens of places. And we focused on one. I want to see how close you got. Where are we going, Stephanie? She says, Thailand. Oh, wait, we're going to Thailand. I show this postcard. And then... Uh, I open up the prediction and inside the prediction, it's a, it's kind of a mini book and it talks about things that happened during the show. So I'll talk about like, we're going to bring three of our extra friends, Oprah Winfrey, Elvis Presley and Marilyn Monroe. And these are all things that happened during throughout the show. And then I say, and then I show, uh, um, I say, we're all going to wear the same outfit. And it's, that was another predicted outcome in the show. And then we're also, and just don't forget if you get lost in the airport, don't forget the gate number. It's blah, 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 blah. And it's the serial number from the bill that was borrowed for the bill in Lyme. So it's like, it's, it's again, all hail Darren Brown and, <laughs> and Andy Nyman for, for making us all, you know, do these prediction effects. 
but anyway, so that's that's kind of it's like a it's like a denouement bookend for the whole show, and then um, then the book flips open, and it's a massive, um, it's a massive image of the postcard of the Thailand or whatever the wherever the place is that that she's chosen, and that's the end of the show. So that's I, I realize that the effect is the, the effect is smart ass, but it's basically a, a prediction effect, and that's uh, that's how I close the show. Superb. Excellent. I love the the full circleness of that as well. Um, but I know our guests couldn't see, but those cards are gorgeous as well. They're really yeah, really thanks. nice. Yeah, we just we just had these. Uh, I've had, I've had this prototype for for a long time, and we're finally releasing them. It's going to be in the next. Um, the next. <laughs> there's the uh, there's the hell card. <laughs> yeah, so we're going to be releasing these in the next. Uh, in the next couple months we have we have them all printed they're all waiting i just need to uh shoot some video and but yeah it's, they're really gorgeous and again if you're familiar with if you're familiar with any smart ass effect um you know the beauty is that you can hand them the cards they can separate the cards and toss them away so it's a it, again it's a really interactive bulletproof method of forcing that looks really cl- really clean um i got a really cool text from from Michael Lamar uh, a week ago, two weeks ago, he was, he was doing, doing the castle. And he said, Bill, I want the best card for, I'm, I'm terrible. Michael Lamar impression, but best card for us uh, in the world. And I came to you. So <laughs> anyways, he was asking for a smart ass deck, which was cool. But anyways, I, what I, what I love about, what I love about this ending is that again, it brings, like you said, it brings everything together at the end. Um, I keep music, kind of a, a a a a light bed of rhythm beneath this whole effect that keeps the effect moving because it is an encore piece and people are antsy at the end of this at this point it's it's almost it's close to 60 minutes um the the show so uh and i mean in my opinion that's long enough for people to sit so uh i know that they're they're ready to go and if they've had you know a couple cocktails which we always encourage um they're they're already ready to you know to use the restroom so at this point i want to keep the show moving so this is this is a fairly quick i would say it's over in like three minutes it's not not something that drags it sounds like it's a lot of process and stuff like that but i keep it moving quite quickly and uh the smart ass force in my opinion is just it's just so bulletproof and easy that you don't have to think it's uh you know you can just perform and enjoy it knowing that it's always going to be the outcome, but more importantly, that it's going to look so clean and so fair that it just looks impossible, which is obviously the point. But, um, and again, I put smart ass as the last, um, thing in my show. And there's, I've been a multitude of different versions of it with playing cards, with index cards, with, um, with tarot cards. And now, now I've been using this postcard deck, um, and it's really strong. It's really um, just a powerful ending. Hard to beat. Well, those natives that you mentioned at the very beginning on your <laughs> island are going to have one hell of a time watching this. I actually feel like I've literally just watched you perform <laughs> a show. Um, and hopefully everyone at home listening will feel the same. But it does bring us onto your two curveball items. So yes. number one, the book, which you only get to pick one as opposed to the tricks where you got eight and your non-magic item. So what did you put in your book position? I put uh, Impromptu Magic by Martin Gardner. And I, again, it's it's been, that's been kind of a, you know, kind of a Bible for me in the world of magic and in the, in the, in my exciting, my brain in all kinds of directions for many, many years. And uh, it's just one of those books that you can just crack open and read something, read a paragraph and it will turn your brain onto something. I really see, I really see it as a brain exercise. Most of the time I, I, it's not that I, I have, I have actually used effects in the book, but it's more of a brain exercise to like, to take your brain in a direction that maybe you didn't think of or didn't. Um, and if you're not familiar with the book, it's a, it's a large book that has, it's a, it's an alphabetical order of objects. So um, Apple, you'll look up Apple under a, and then you'll see, you know, a dozen effects with an apple. So it'll talk about, you know, um, cutting an apple with your mind, 
you know, doing a, taking an apple and a string and stringing across two people and having the apple move between the two people. It, it really, uh, the exciting thing about it every time I open it is like, you know, as human beings, our brains are susceptible or our memories are susceptible to, you know, to, uh, to disintegrating. And for me, every time I open it, I, I read something new. It could be, it could be the Alzheimer's, but I read something new every single time. And it always excites my brain with in a direction. Um, and I think if you're on a desert Island and you're, you know, you got a lot of time in your hands, I think it's the kind of the perfect type of book, um, you know, you know, failing the, the Tarbell course of magic, which I also feel is, you know, obviously that's seven volumes or eight volumes, um, which technically isn't a, that's too many books. That's not one book. <laughs> um, the impromptu Martin Gardner is, I think to me is just the killer, just, just the best. It's just really, um, really such a great, uh, instigator for my brain in so many ways. It's one of those ones that you can just con constantly go back to. And each time you read it, you discover something new or you find something new, or maybe it affects something in your show now that wasn't there before and and it clicks into place for you so yeah i think it's a superb superb choice um but it does bring us onto your truly curveball item your non-magic <laughs> item that you use for magic what did you go for i just uh it's two objects but they they're kind of synonymous and it's uh, just a pen and a pad of paper great and i'm constantly making notes the my my phone sadly has taken over my my memo pads that I have still boxes of hanging around the house. Um, so, but uh, if I go to the beach, I leave my phone at home and I will bring my pad in paper because that's to me is like that's that's really that's really what motivates me in magic is 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 the creativity. It's it's really solution it's finding solutions for challenges or finding solutions to problems or finding solutions to tricks. So you'll think of like, Oh, what's the best way to do this? And then it's a solution finding process of what is the best method for this effect? What is the best word or line for this routine? What is the best premise for this effect? All of those things, that's the work. So for me, having a patent paper, uh, I would instantly throw my phone into a, <laughs> into the ocean. If I could just, uh right and uh and that that would be my my go-to because it is my go-to you know whether it's my phone and typing into notes or a physical pad and paper that's that's really that's my other my other joy in performing and then planning what i'm going to perform next <laughs> Yeah, great. And I'll let them be linked together by string. There you go. So now it's Thank one you. object. Thank there you, you go. Okay. Excellent. What a great list and what a great book and item. If anyone wants to find out more about you, Bill, then where can they go? Well, there's two things. You can go to Bill Abbott Magic. Uh, that's Abbott with two B's, two T's. BillAbbottMagic.com. And that's where you'll see um, all of the effects that that we produce and that we sell internationally. Um, uh, I have a fondness for the UK because I've lectured there. I've done two big lecture tours there and, and I've done a couple of the big conventions there, which I've always loved. It always, I need to get back. It's been a while. I did Blackpool probably three or four years ago, I think pre pandemic, I think it was 2019, but I need to get back and um, see all my mates. Uh, but BillAbbottMagic.com is the best place to find my effects. Uh, we also wholesale a lot, a lot of them through Murphy's Magic, and they're distributed around the world. Alkazam has a lot of my effects. Um, you can also, uh, there's an Alkazam. Uh, I did a cocktail magic uh, lecture at Alkazam. Uh, so you can find that on the site there. And uh, if you're ever in Florida, please come and see our show. Um, if you go to magichideaway.com, that's our our weekly show. We have a show every in a, in a beautiful hotel, uh, which you can see right there in the background. That I'm I'm pointing to a, <laughs> to a big screen behind <laughs> me that that showcases the hotel room. In case you're wondering what's going on, um, and we do that show every week. So uh, if you're ever in town, would love to have you there. 
Oh, that's my new initiative is to try and get to Florida to see it. Um, yeah, especially if, it, if it's this, uh, this set as well, then uh, I'll definitely be. There'll definitely be tricks in that set for sure. Absolutely. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for giving us your time, Bill, and thank you for sharing your um, list with us. That was my pleasure. And thank you all for listening. Please do share the love and, and do share it around as much as you can. Obviously, the more listeners we get, the more incredible guests that we can have on this podcast. So thank you for listening once again, and we will see you again next week on another episode of Desert Island Tricks. Goodbye. Hi, Peter Nardi here, and I really hope you enjoyed that podcast. I just wanted to make you know that Alakazam have their own app. You can download it from the App Store or the Google Play Store. By downloading the app, it will make your shopping experience even slicker at Alakazam. You'll also get exclusive in-app offers and in-app live streams. So go download it now, and we'll see you on the next podcast.